Hello, and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 211, recorded on December 26, 2021. I'm Chris. And I'm Wes. Hello, Wes. And this week, we're not doing the news. Not this week. No, we're going to start with an update about the show itself. Starting next week, January 2nd, Linux Unplugged will be moving into LAN's current Sunday time slot. That means Linux Action News will be moving to a little later in the week to hopefully better capture the news cycle. Right, that and really kind of balance out the entire Jupiter Broadcasting release schedule as well. So starting in the new year, all going to plan, of course, the next episode of Linux Action News will be out January 6th and then every Thursday after that. We'll monitor this adjustment and watch for your feedback at linuxactionnews.com slash contact. But the underlying goal here is to better position both LUP and LAN to sort of play to their relative strengths. And don't worry, I know a lot of you out there are Monday land commuters. Linux Unplugged will be in that time slot. It'll be there for you, and it'll be better than ever at linuxunplugged.com slash subscribe. We're just kind of moving things around on the board a little bit for the new year. But with that business of show out of the way, let's get to the predicting. Well, first, we've got to own up for last year. And I guess I'll start. <laughs> I thought that by this time, Mozilla would probably have just killed Pocket. But no, seems like Pocket is still alive and kicking. I liked this prediction, not because I wanted to see Pocket die, but because I thought it was both possible and a bit bold. Uh, because, you know, at this time last year, we weren't really sure what was going to happen with Mozilla. It seemed like this was going to be a make or break it year. But overall, 2021 worked out to be a better year for Mozilla than I think either one of us expected. And I don't think they got to a position where they needed to make cutbacks like this. Because I listened back to the episode, Wes, and it sounded like that was your angle on this was, well, they're going to have to make cuts because things are trending badly and this is where they're going to cut. Yeah, I think I've just been questioning how invested have they actually been in Pocket. Now, I'll admit, I do give it some clicks when I'm using Firefox. They do have some articles that I think are interesting but it's just a small piece of the evolving story of how does Mozilla get money, right? Like, I mean, they're still, at least in 2020, really dependent on their search revenue from Google. Something like 86% of their revenue came from that source. So while their services are growing, it still seems like an open question. Yeah, I agree there. Um, their VPN service has seen some good growth there. There's there's some good trends, better trends at the end at this point than when we did this show last year. All right, I'll own up to uh, one of mine, which uh, I think I got right, but I'm going to preface this. Listening to this right now, it's going to seem like this was an obvious one. But when I made this prediction, Alma Linux hadn't been announced yet. We had just really learned about the end of the traditional CentOS release. So I predicted that at least three CentOS clones would ship essentially a 1.0 or their first stable release in 2021. And that's exactly what happened. Alma Linux, Rocky Linux, uh, Springdale Linux, and a few other clones did end up shipping. Um, not, I guess, a huge surprise, although for a little bit there, some of us thought maybe Rocky wasn't going to actually make it. <laughs> All right, I have a couple of thoughts here, but let's start with um, what is Springdale again? Because I, I don't <laughs> think we've cited that previously on Linux Action News. <laughs> no, I had to go look because I knew Alma and Rocky had done it, right? And I was like, well, okay, who else? Because I don't think Scientific Linux is presently shipping. So I had to go find another one. And it's a thing. And they've shipped. <laughs> shipped an ISO. Uh, so I guess it counts, I think. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. I mean, it does make me think one uncertainty we had was we didn't really know, like, were there going to be one? Were there going to be two, three, or a whole bunch? bunch of clones because i mean once you've got some in this space that prove it out you can just keep copying it's it's open source after all yeah i i, I almost am surprised we didn't end up with like 10 or 15 you know and of course like nine of them are horrible but uh it, it does seem like it's just maybe a harder task than oh i just copy the uh source rpms and rebuild it i think uh Turned out to be a harder job than that. So, but we did get at least a handful of them out there. And then I think the other thing that we didn't really know, but we have a much clearer picture of now, is there's a lot of folks that just seem to be happy with Stream itself and are just sticking with CentOS and Stream. And, and then something we learned on Linux Unplugged last week, pretty sizable people said, screw it, I'm going to Ubuntu. And none of us predicted that because, <laughs> you know, it just seemed like too much of a, of a pain in the butt. Yeah, that definitely caught me by surprise as well. But... Speaking of Ubuntu, it's my turn again. 
I predicted, hoped even perhaps, that Ubuntu would ship Systemd Home D sometime in 2021. And I'm sad to say that didn't happen. Did anybody, did any of the major desktop distros, I should say, uh, ship Systemd Home D by default? I don't think they did. And in that episode, we were like, well, Fedora will probably do it. But I don't even think, I mean, the version of Systemd that has it may have shipped. But you specifically put yourself into a corner when you said, not only will the bits ship, but it'll be configured and enabled by default. And you said, Fedora is too certain, so I'm going to go for a risky pick and choose Ubuntu because you had like this this really nice optimistic dream that they were going to be pushing the desktop technology stack forward very aggressively in 2021, which just didn't really pan out. No, wow. Yeah, 2020 Wes, so naive. I think kind of the story we've been talking about, sadly, is is some desktop disappointment with Ubuntu, with the Canonical's efforts there. I mean, a lot still happening on, on the server side, but it just has not been the space to watch for exciting changes or innovation on the desktop. You never know, though, Wes. There is an LTS coming up. Things could change. Uh, my next one was pretty bad. You know, I was this was one of those where I, I thought maybe I was onto something because I was reading tea leaves, which, in other words, is mailing list posts. You don't even drink tea. I know, I, you know, it hurts the tummy, but uh, I thought Bcash FS would make it into the Linux kernel in 2021. I didn't necessarily think any distributions would use it or do anything with it, but I thought, you know, by the end of the year, a shipping stable version of the Linux kernel would have Bcash FS mainlined. And the things that I was reading in the mailing list were that they had hired a dedicated tester, um, There was a bunch of things I'd already identified. It looked like they were on track to have some major stuff dialed in by summer. Um, And that, you know, if they got those bugs fixed by summer, then I had expected by, you know, winter to be mainlined. And it just didn't, it just didn't happen. And, you know, it's funny because here we are now at the end of 2021. And I'm seeing some of that same stuff that makes me think maybe 2022, you know, because I I could almost make that prediction and say it's going to happen in 2022. But uh, I am not. I may save it for Linux Unplugged, and I will own up to the fact that it did not ship in 2021. I got that one wrong, unfortunately, despite how much I would have loved to see that. I would have loved it. It just would have been so great. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, that definitely shouldn't take away from Kent Overstreet's hard work continuing the development. I mean, on one on one hand, I'm, I'm a little disappointed. I think we're all excited to see what BcashFS might offer. But on the other side of that coin, this is a file system after all. and. It's better to get it right than fast. Linode.com slash LAN. Linode loves Linux. And I love Linux too, so I can tell. You know, you you can't fake that kind of thing. And it's how we run everything now. Like, we've built everything out on Linode for the last couple of years. You should really try it out because I'm sitting here telling you it's great. And that's after years of now actually using it in production, running my business infrastructure, and running my personal stuff. You know, the kind of stuff you never want to go down because you don't want you don't want things to be down for, for your customers, or in my case, your audience. And you don't want things to be down when you're just sitting down for a few minutes with the kiddos to play a little uh, game. You know, like maybe you maybe you got like 15, 20 minutes to play a game, right? You don't want to deal with crappy performance or outages. That's just not the time for that kind of thing. And I've never had that problem with Linode. And, you know, there's been opportunities for them to be tested, like this recent log for j vulnerability. Linode really stepped up to the plate on that. If you're curious about what I'm talking about, go check their blog, go check their Twitter feed. I mean, they were just following this stuff from day one, making sure everybody is solid and taken care of. And they just have the best support in the business. Phone, ticket, email, whatever your method is, they're there every day of the year. They don't do that escalation thing where they try to, like, pawn you off on some some like you know first layer tech thing no they take care of you they they handle it right there there's no there's none of that it's really nice to know that's there but here's the best part when you go to linode.com slash land you get a hundred dollars to work with that's linode saying they have confidence that if you actually put this thing into production they know you're gonna like it right because i mean they could give you like 10 bucks 15 bucks then you could run some of their rigs for like two three months right because they got great prices they're 30 to 50 percent less than the major hyperscalers out there But with $100, you could build real infrastructure or you could really learn an entirely new system. Maybe you've been wanting to build an environment from scratch using Ansible or Terraform. This is your opportunity. Go do it and support the show. Have some fun, learn something, and support the show. Linode.com slash LAN. And a big thank you to Ting 
linux.ting.com. Stop overpaying for cell service. Why not do it right now at the beginning of a new year? Just start saving from the very beginning. Linux.ting.com. Go there and take 25 bucks off whatever you end up going with, a new device or a new plan. You see, Ting is an MVNO, a mobile virtual network operator. That means a couple of things. That means they have several nationwide networks for you to choose from. That also means that your device is likely already compatible because of that multi-network compatibility. And then on top of it, it means that they're not digging holes. They're not fighting with local authorities. They're not trying to get new laws passed and lobbying the state to get new towers installed. They don't have to manage any of that. So their business focuses on the customer and creating value. And they've nailed it. That's why I've been a customer since 2013. It's just a smarter way to do mobile. It's probably how the industry would have to operate today if they were to like reset everything from the ground up. They have plans that start around $10 a month and they kind of go up from there depending on if what you need. A lot of their stuff is just like so simple that you just go to the website and it's just one of them is going to be obvious which one should work for you. You know, they got plans with unlimited data, unlimited calls, and every single plan has the nationwide LTE and 5G coverage. How great is that? And maybe one of my favorite things is no contracts. They stay flexible. Over the years, I've dialed back my usage. I've increased my usage. I've gone on road trips. I've been all over the place, and Ting has remained flexible and awesome and a great value. So here's how you get started. You go to linux.ting.com. You check your current phone. You create an account. You pick the plan that's right for you. Ting's going to send you a SIM card. You're going to pop that SIM card into your phone, and then you're going to get activated in minutes because they have a really nice, clean dashboard. Boop, boop, boop. You're ready to go. You didn't even have to talk to a human if you didn't want to. If you do want to, they got great customer support. Cutting your phone bill in half has never been easier. Ting has great plans. You got to go check them out. Kick off a new year and save a little bit of money. And take 25 bucks off whatever you find at linux.ting.com. And now it's time for our 2022 predictions. I'll start things off. I think that sometime in 2022, Sousa will release a RHEL clone of their very own. Now, this is something we've speculated a bit before, specifically in LAN 210, but they already offer RHEL support, and there were some clues from Apple and our friend Carl George that maybe there's something more in the works. I could see it happening, and 2022 seems like the year that it might. Yeah, I, I thought if it was going to happen, they would have tried to have shipped before end of life for CentOS. I suppose there's still a few more hours on that clock as we record right now. Um, I say you're still going to get it if they if they release it in 2021, because this, this is either going to ship or they're going to just shut down the whole thing. Uh, the rumor mill has it that once we started talking about it on the show and it started showing up on Twitter, the word went out internally to shut off all, like, Apple repositories, so we no longer have any external numbers to go on. But what we did see for a short period was what seemed to be a SUS designed and built rail clone that was connecting two external repositories and checking in for updates. Quote, Liberty Linux. Right. Liberty Linux was the tagline, and there was multiple connections. It wasn't just one or two or three. It was many. And um, this could be kind of like a kind of really calculated move by SUS to make it easy to migrate from RHEL to a SUSE infrastructure. They did something similar like this back in the NetWare days, where they made it really easy to transition from NetWare to SUSE in part by emulating NetWare. <laughs> and it was a strategy that worked for them. So I, I think it's a solid bet, Wes. Yeah, you know, I mean... They've already got robust build tools out there, so I don't think that's going to be too much of an issue. They're familiar with the RPM ecosystem, and they already provide commercial enterprise support. I mean, if anyone's going to try this, it seems like it might be them. Right. That's the other aspect of this that we forget, is they do have like a cheaper than RHEL patch service uh, that you can get that will patch SUSE boxes and RHEL boxes today. So you can actually purchase a SUSE tool to patch your RHEL boxes. So they're they're already probably maintaining, I would imagine, their own RPM repositories. They're already taking the source RPMs and building them, possibly. Um, so it would, could just be they're increasing that infrastructure and growing that out. I hope we see it uh, because I think it's going to shock people to see SUSE shipping a RHEL clone. And I think it's going to make for a fun story if it ever happens. And if it doesn't happen, if we're sitting here this time next year and it hasn't shipped, it's going to be like, what the hell happened? Because we saw it showing up on the numbers. Something was out there called Liberty Linux coming from SUSE IPs. <laughs> so. All right, now mine, I feel like my next one is a pretty sure bet. I think both of us just want at least one win <laughs> is what I feel like these first ones are. And that's mine. This one, everybody's going to roll their eyes when I say it, but 
you know, might as well try to get an easy win. Asahi is going to ship, Asahi Linux is going to ship an installer for getting their version of Linux or, or like, you know, a, an installer that gets another version like Arch or Debian or something like that on M1 hardware. I imagine it won't be an entire standalone distro, but more of a tool to get an existing distro on an M1 Mac. But it could be its own distro too. It's pretty broad, but... But that's something that's like targeted at end users and not just potential developers or people trying to contribute to the bootstrapping effort. Something like you might use to run a real desktop day-to-day on an M1 machine. It seems like you could you could see a scenario where a developer edition, which is already kind of out there, there are, there's already docs on how to do it by hand. And you could see maybe a, a little rougher version of an installer coming to market first that is really for like your first wave adopters. And then by the end of the year there's something that's really, even before the end of the year, you know, midway, there's something targeted for average users who, average Linux users who just, you know, maybe picked up an M1 and they want to try getting Linux on it now that's maybe a year old or so. I think that's going to become, as because you think about it in terms of M1 hardware age, right now, you know, when, when the, and even when the project, especially when the project first started, some of these people, you know, they just got themselves a, a $12, $2,000, two, $1,300, whatever it is, MacBook. It's precious. You know, you don't you don't want to try slamming Linux on that thing right now, but you know, a year year and a half into it, it's just you know your old laptop at that point. So yeah, once you take it for granted, you've already messed it up a couple of times and had to reinstall. What a great time for a new Linux installer to come out and for people to start slamming Linux on them. And I think that could also play well for a crowdfunded project. So that's my prediction: is that in 2021, you're going to see Asahi ship an installer for average Linux users, people who are familiar with Linux and want to get it on an M1 machine. I know it's kind of a, it's probably a sure bet, but that also just speaks to the confidence I have in the project. Okay, well, my question then is, if that happens, is that what it takes for you to start trying Asahi on your M1, Chris? Oh, I think so. You know, because um, I didn't even touch on like GPU accelerated graphics, because for me personally, I don't even need it. I would love to be able to run a headless M1 server in my RV off solar because they, you know, even under load, it's taken hardly any power compared to most systems. I think it'd just make a great little headless server. So yeah, I'm all about it. As soon as they, as soon as they're shipping, I'm installing. Well, speaking of neat things in small packages, my next prediction is that SteamOS will have a community fork out there sometime in 2022. You know, with the deck launching, with people getting really excited I could see the community wanting to leverage some of Valve's hard work sort of stabilizing Arch and then shipping something that kind of bridges the gap and makes it a little more useful for, you know, non-strictly gaming uses. Something that makes the AUR easy to set up, something that just sort of smooths the gap between regular Arch. Hmm. Something that says, hey, you out there, you want a workstation that's gaming ready and has a uh, OS tree style file system? Well, we've got a distro for you. Something that strips away some of the branding, you know, sort of all that Red Hat to CentOS, where they make sure they don't have any custom logos or trademark stuff in there. And then they, uh, you know, they sell it as Vapor Linux, or uh, I guess maybe not Vapor, that's already out there. Um, you know, I don't know what what you could call it, but something that's probably a play on Valve or Steam, right? And then you go download that thing. Coal-powered Linux? I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, gasoline Linux? I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, and maybe it's got an, maybe it's got like a script that installs Steam. I don't know how it works, but I could totally see that happening. I hope it does, actually. I'm going to be really disappointed if this prediction doesn't come true because I want I want to try it. <laughs> well, yeah, that's just it. You know, I don't I don't know that I really... I, I tried running the last Steam OS kind of as a day-to-day way back in the day. I could see playing with it briefly, but, you know, if there's not something that's really meant for that, I, I think I'll just keep it for the gaming use cases. But... I am looking for another art replacement. I mean, who's not? Well, I suppose step one will be just getting the deck to ship. And then step two is going to be Valve needs to release SteamOS. And hopefully they'll be good about it and release all the bits. <laughs> oh, geez. Now that you say that, that's a lot that needs to happen. But uh, fingers crossed. There's some milestones, though. You know, we can watch those milestones. We'll find out. Okay, here is my next prediction. It's a bit of a long shot, but boy, do I really hope this is going to happen. So I'm looking at the Raspberry Pi lineup, and I'm, I'm liking what I'm seeing with the compute module a lot this year. I think that's made the Raspberry Pi a totally new kind of interesting for me. Um, my Pi 400 is one of my best little pieces of hardware I've ever bought. I keep it set up in my office, ready to go for like basic business stuff, you know, for when I have to be a businessman. 
And I think that's really nice. So I thought maybe I'd try to make a prediction in this realm. And I was looking at the Raspberry Pi 4, which has been really solid for me. I've been using it as a server. And, you know, they launched the Pi 4 Model B in June of 2019, towards the end of June 2019. And they have a lot going on. And there is a worldwide part shortage. So this is, it's hard to say. But I feel like... Enough hedging already. Out with it. I think maybe we're going to see a Raspberry Pi 5 at least announced in 2022. I don't know if it's going to be able to ship, though, because of supply chain woes. In fact, what we could end up seeing is a Pi 4A, you know, because you've got something that... um, that they've 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 remarked on is that their engineering team hasn't had a very good collaborative year with work from home. It's been tough on their team. Uh, they've had supply chain issues. Uh, parts costs are going up. So the devices they're making right now, they're making them as fast as they can. So what we may end up only getting is a Pi 4A, but my long shot would be a Raspberry Pi 5. That would be, you know, and then if I could go all the way, Wes, Raspberry Pi 5 with a 16 gig of RAM option and eMMC, but that's just not going to happen. Well, well, okay, what comes in the 4A then? The 4A, I think, is a, yeah, it's a CPU bump, you know, uh, 8 gigs of RAM still. I don't think the 4A is a big change other than some maybe like board or, or, you know, PCI layout changes. Maybe something in that regard. Something that makes me look at it and go, hmm, you know, I could use it for, you know, something new or something extra. It's tough to say because the compute module actually brings so much to the table that I'm not, I'm not totally sure, but I could always use more memory and I could always use more CPU. Well, I'm just curious to see, you know, I think with the 4, it got really close to sort of using a Pi in the um, Chromebook territory of performance and like, you know, low-end Linux desktop. So maybe a 4A, but I think certainly a 5 could really take that to the next level. How do I make this? How do I square this? Because it's like, it's really two predictions. We're going to either, I just, I think they're going to, they're going to rev the current 4, right? That's what I'm going for. The mo- the, the Raspberry Pi 4 Model B is going to get a rev of some kind. It's going to, I don't know how they're going to do it. They may replace it all together with the Raspberry Pi 5, or they may be like the B plus. If they, if the, if the Pi 4 hasn't been replaced, you know, with like a next iteration at this time next year, I think it's a, I think it's a loss. Because like if they update the Picos or the Pi 400, that doesn't count. It's got to be the flagship Big Pi. Ah, uh, the flagship Pi. Okay, okay. Well, I think you're going to get this one. I'll be surprised if not, but time will tell. We will see. Um, I read a couple of interviews that make me think it's not going to happen because they were setting expectations low. <laughs> so we'll see, but I'd love to see it. Uh, and then we have we have a Linux Action News tradition here on the show. I don't know why, but it started with Joe and I talking about Bitcoin and trying to make our annual Bitcoin predictions. And it just seems like an impossible thing to do, but we did want to do a little reflection. Yeah, we like being wrong. And what better way than to uh, try to speculate about the price of uh, cryptocurrency? There's no better way. There's no better way to be wrong faster either. Um, And 2021 was a wild year for cryptocurrency and Bitcoin in general. Uh, At the beginning of the year, Bitcoin shot up to nearly $40,000 at the end of January. Uh, April 3rd, it broke $63,000. And then it just ramped down and up for the rest of summer. And then in early October... An all-time high of $68,000 was hit and then crashed down about 40% for about four days and then has built up some of its losses. And it's now, as we record, sitting around 51000 But here's some interesting numbers for you, Wes. As of 2021, the entire crypto market, when you include like Ethereum and a lot of the altcoins, is now worth $2.4 trillion. It's truly just become its own economy. And to put that in perspective... Crypto market is 2.4 trillion. All of France's economy is 3 trillion. India's economy, 2.8 trillion. If you take out just Bitcoin, Bitcoin is a trillion on its own, over a trillion on its own, which is larger than Italy's economy by a lot. It's (laughs) just Bitcoin alone is barking at the size of India's economy. I mean, you know, that's something, Wes. That is, those are huge, huge numbers. Well, and it just seems to be uh, far more present just in the culture, right? I mean, many folks who are otherwise not interested in technology or speculating in stocks, well, they, they know what crypto is, and maybe they have a small amount of it. It's certainly become more popular in institutions. Yeah, that's been 
It's been a big trend this year. Some large institutions, including JP Morgan, we've seen MicroStrategy go all in. Um, El Salvador, um, my, the city of Miami. <laughs> These really interesting ones. Uh, Coinbase had their IPO. Rocky year, but they're doing them kind of better now towards the end of the year. Um, that Those all were big institutional moves that started to legitimize cryptocurrency for, I think, another wave of adoption. Uh, you still have tons and tons of critics and skeptics out there, but I think another wave of adoption happened in 2021. Like you're saying, getting really close to that to that near mainstream. And it's, it's really interesting how it sort of reminded me a lot of Linux's early uptake. A lot of people thought, what, what does it do that Windows doesn't do or Netware isn't doing? What is the critical app of Linux? What is its critical function? A lot of people were skeptical about the security model, about open source and free software developers just donating their time, about IP issues, a lot of early skepticism. And then some of us really saw some potential in it and really stuck with it. And then, you know, 30 years later, and it <laughs> dominates the world. I, I Bitcoin, you know, it's been around since 2009. And if you look at its trajectory and you compare it to previous adoptions, a lot of people will compare it to the internet and say that it has you know, a faster pace of adoption than the, than the internet did in its early years. But I don't know if it's an apt comparison because Bitcoin is more like a protocol. It's more like the slow adoption of TCP IP. When TCP IP was announced, there was dozens of competitors, NetBuoy, IPX, Apple Talk, all token, all these different, different network standards that all of these different vendors tried to push and sort of poo-pooed all over TCP IP. But over time, it just became the great unifier. It became the great nullifier, and it just took over. And it seems like we're seeing a similar trajectory that just has become obvious in 2021. Token Ring was obviously trying to hint at our crypto future. <laughs> the other thing that happened was a China ban on mining, which represented a ginormous portion of the Bitcoin network. They cracked down, and the network hash rate dropped. And then the mining spun up mostly in Western countries, and now the hash rate's higher than it was before China did the crackdown. So it's it's hard to say like what could twenty twenty two possibly what could we what could happen right you you have you have world economies that are a mess I mean who knows it's just it feels more impossible than ever to make a prediction because there's so many factors now. Well, that's just it. I think it's um you know it's more in the front of everyone's mind. We're waiting on decisions about regulation, and I think we're waiting to see what twenty twenty two brings for the overall market and you know i'm i'm kind of curious to see what bears out when we do have more of a bear market and if people are forced to start to divest in some of their holdings do they choose to do that in stocks or gold or is crypto the thing that they sell first i don't know but i'm curious to see what happens mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so here's my prediction uh because i got a price prediction but i actually think there's something else that probably should be called out here so right now like if you just look within the last week or two you'll find several accredited, intelligent people who say Bitcoin's going to collapse. A Carol Alexander, professor of finance over at Sussex University or Sussex University, uh, said that she expects Bitcoin to tank as low as $10,000 in 2022. Um, she says it's going to wipe out the gains of basically the last two years. And if you're invested in Bitcoin, you should get out now. It has no fundamental value. And then you've got others that say it has intrinsic value because it's a digital currency you can send anywhere around the world. There's a fixed cost to mine it. The utility of it gives it its worth. And then, of course, like humans, it's worth whatever we say it is. And this is a mine. These are two battles that have been playing out since 2009. And I think in 2022, one side's going to have to shut up. Either the this thing's going to the moon side's going to win, or the people that say this thing, like your Peter Schiff's or your Carol Alexander's, that say this thing's going to crash. They're going to have to shut up by the end of 2022 because it's going to get to a point where it's just either going to be ludicrous to make those claims anymore or it's going to be they were right all along. And so we'll, we will end that debate. And in the process of sorting all of this out, it's either going to be heralded as the moment right before the big crash or the moment right before it took off Bitcoin, at least momentarily in 2022, I predict will hit $70,000. I see you're not stepping too far out, right? If it was uh, 68 or so back in October, then just hitting 70 sometime in the year, that's that that doesn't seem too outlandish. But I guess my question is, where do you think it's going to end up, right? Okay, we might have another you know summer of crypto where everyone's excited, but December next year, where are we going to be? Tough to say, huh? Because it does it does seem like more and more of the normals are learning about cryptocurrencies, Ethereum included. And here's something else I've noticed. 
uh, Linux appeals to a narrow band of people that are trying to get something done or have a certain philosophy about the world. But a lot of people like making money. And so people who are not technically inclined are interested in making money. And uh, I gave my son a little bit of Bitcoin for Christmas and he's 12 years old. You know what though? You know what, Wes? He got it immediately. And the fact that it was digital and not like tied to a physical metal or something is a complete non-issue for my son who, you know, has lived in a Minecraft style metaverse and just works with digital stuff. He's done online schooling. Like all of it is digital to him. It's all digital. And so to him, the fact that it's a digital asset is huge because he's 12 years old right now. All of a sudden he's basically got a bank on his phone and he's thinking about how to convert this cash that he's got into that. So that way maybe he'll grow that a little bit over time. Just thinking like the way he just got it made me realize the younger generation, like, you know, younger than you and I, are even more digitally inclined. They're even more just tuned into this kind of thing. And so you got those people coming online. They're going to have some spendable money. You know, 18, 19, 20, 25 year olds. They're going to be coming online. They're going to be able to get the cash app. They're going to be able to, you know, get the strike app. Well, that's just it, right? That there, it's it's so it's so much easier now. You don't have to understand necessarily how to host your own wallet or, or be running software on your system. There's There's friendly apps that let you buy stocks and crypto at the same time. Also, you got the fact that as of 2021, 90% of all Bitcoins have been mined. Only 10% of the 21 million now remains. That is going to create a supply crunch. Also, I mean, just thinking of price pressure, the Bitcoin miners are holding, right? The exchanges are at a three-year inventory low for Bitcoin right now because the Bitcoin miners are holding, waiting for the prices to come up. And you've also got inflation in the U.S. that's really bad right now, not just the U.S., right? I mean, Bitcoin is a worldwide currency and inflation is going rampant in all kinds of places. And there's going to be a percentage, right or wrong, that see Bitcoin as an inflation hedge. So those things, I think, are going to drive the price up. But then you have the fact that here in the States, interest rates are going up. So cheap or free money is going away. So the institutional investors are going to pull back. So... (laughs) It really seems like it could be anyone's game. But when you factor in the limited supply, the fact that inflation is a problem, mainstream adoption, easy technological innovations, the fact that we really haven't seen the benefits from the Lightning Network coming online yet, which is going to make transactions super fast and super cheap, and you have El Salvador that's just kind of getting their stuff sorted out, I kind of feel like on the all, it's going to end up higher than lower. And when I say 70,000, I hope I'm, I hope it's going to be higher than 70,000. But, you know, <laughs> if you pin your hopes on something like that, <laughs> Bitcoin will disappoint. Yeah, I think I'll be, I'll be the bear today then. And uh, not, not too much, but I think we're just going to see a flat 2020. Probably this time next year, we'll be flirting around 50, 50K, just the same that we are now. You know, maybe a little over, maybe a little under, but nothing too far different from 50K. I mean, that sounds boring, but reasonable, Wes, you know, especially with the altcoins like Ethereum and others out there that are showing some interesting technical solutions. I could see the money going from Bitcoin to things like Ethereum or Solana, stuff like that. We'll see. Um, We don't know. That's why we only talk about it once a year. Otherwise, it's back to Linux and open source for us starting in January on Thursdays. So go to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe. So that way you don't miss a single episode in the transition. And linuxactionnews.com slash contact for ways to keep in touch. And join us on a Sunday now. Linux Unplugged will be live over at jblive.tv around 1230 Pacific. And that would be 3 p.m. Eastern at jblive.tv. As for this show, well, we'll be back Thursday the 6th with our weekly take on the latest Linux and open source news. Thanks for joining us and Happy New Year. 